Continuing on with our last section in Unit 3, this is learning target 5E, which is titled Theorems, Theorems, and More Theorems. So we're going to learn about a couple more theorems or concepts and then help us put that together with some of the tools that we've learned earlier in this unit to be able to solve any polynomial to find the factor form and all of the roots. So by the end of this lesson, you will be able to use the Rational Roots Theorem to find the possible rational roots of a polynomial. You will be able to use the conjugate root theorem to find any additional irrational or complex roots or determine the minimal degree of a polynomial given some of those roots. And lastly, we'll be able to find all the roots of a polynomial, including the rational, imaginary, and irrational roots using all the theorems from this unit. So the first thing we're going to look at is something that we've already actually talked about before, we just haven't given it a name. It's something I've been hinting at in each one of these sections, and that is the fundamental theorem of algebra. So the fundamental theorem of algebra says if p of x is a polynomial of degree n greater than or equal to 1, then p of x equaling 0 has exactly n roots, including multiple and complex roots. This is what we've been saying all along, even way back to our last unit. If we have a quadratic equation, the degree of a quadratic is 2, and that's why for every quadratic equation we were finding, we were finding two roots. Now sometimes we maybe only had one root because that root had a multiplicity of two, so we aren't going to necessarily get n unique roots, but we will get a total of n roots including the multiplicities and any complex roots. And in learning target 5c, when we were going through and solving those polynomial equations, we were making sure that we ended up with the same number of roots as our degree. Our next theorem that we're going to look at is called the rational roots theorem. So the rational roots theorem says if I have p of x, which is a polynomial in standard form, so this again with our a sub n x to the n plus a sub n minus 1 x to the n minus 1 all the way down to our a1 x plus our constant term of a sub 0, that's just remember our general standard form of a polynomial with integer coefficients, so I do have to have integer coefficients here to use the rational roots theorem, then there is a limited number of possible rational roots for this polynomial being equal to zero. And all of the rational roots must have the reduced form p over q, where p is an integer factor of our constant term, so that's that a sub zero, and q is an integer factor of our leading coefficient, which is that a sub n term. This is going to be really helpful when we have to start to figure out what are our roots. In our last section of learning target 5D, the last couple examples that we went through, I gave us one root to start with. And I said, here's a polynomial, I'm going to assume that x plus 1 is a root, and then use that to maybe continue to factor from there. And we did two examples at the end of that video. Well, at, after we did those two examples, I did talk about the fact that we're not always given one root to start with. And the rational roots theorem is going to be our way to get a strategic list of possible rational roots and then use that list to try. So instead of just trying any random number, I kind of have a narrowed down list of possible rational roots. So let's practice just finding this list of possible rational roots. So in examples one, two, and three, for each of the following polynomials, we're going to list all of the possible rational roots. So the rational roots theorem has this p over q concept. And I want to remind us where these are coming from. So p is, remember, an integer factor of our constant term. So it's a, I'm just, I'm not going to write integer factor. I'm just going to assume it is an integer and write our factors of our constant term. In example one, what is our constant term? For example one. So here our constant term is the number 5, so our p values will be our factors of 5 over the q is coming from our factors of our leading coefficient. What's our leading coefficient in example 1? So our leading coefficient in example 1 is 2, so our q terms will be our factors of q. Well, let's think about this. What are all of the factors of 5? Well, 5 is a prime number, so it's only factors that it has is 1 and 5. But just like it could be 1 times 5, it could also be negative 1 times negative 5. So I'm going to put a plus or minus in front of each one of these factors, since we know that we can take two positive numbers to get a positive number and multiply, or two negative numbers multiplied together gives us a positive as well. 
Now for our denominator here, what are our factors of two? So two is also a prime number. The factors of two are gonna be one and two. And again, I've got that plus or minus in front of each one of these. Now, this looks a little funky as a fraction, but this is representing all of them here. But this is really hard to kind of figure out, well, what exactly are those numbers? So what we're gonna do is expand out on this list. So ultimately what's happening here is that any uh, factor in our numerator, I'm dividing by every single factor in our denominator. So I'm gonna take this and take one factor of the numerator at a time and divide it through by each factor in the denominator. So I'm gonna start with the plus or minus one. So I have plus or minus one divided by plus or minus one. So one divided by one gives us one. Then I'm gonna take the plus or minus one divided by the two. Well, one divided by two gives me plus or minus one half. So now I've used the first factor in my numerator. So I'm gonna to go to my second factor. So five divided by one is gonna give us five. So we get plus or minus five then. And then five divided by our two is giving us plus or minus five over two. And if we could reduce any of these down like we did with the one over one and the five over one, we wanna reduce our fractions as much as possible. So for this, this is our list of possible rational roots here. Now I have eight total possible rational roots since I have the plus or minuses on all of these. Our degree here in example one is equal to three. So I know that this polynomial, since it is degree three, has only three roots. So this list of eight roots here, not all of these are going to be roots. These are just the list of possible rational roots. And we're gonna look at some gigantic examples put together where we then take this list of possible rational roots and start using synthetic division until we can find one that works. So let's continue to practice finding this list of possible rational roots. So in example two, we have the polynomial 3x cubed minus 7x squared plus 6x minus 8. And we want to list our possible rational roots. So these are these p's over q's. Where well, remember our p is our factors of our constant term. So what's our constant term in example two? So our constant term in example two is actually negative 8. So we're going to be looking for factors of negative 8 over our q is our factors of our leading coefficient. What's our leading coefficient in example two? So our leading coefficient in this example is gonna be three. So now we wanna find all the possible factors of eight. Why don't you guys list out the possible factors of eight? So eight has a, quite a few factors. It's got one and eight. It also has two and four. So I'm gonna list all of those out just in order from smallest to biggest. Since we're looking for something that multiplies to be negative eight, I would need one of these to be negative and one to be positive. So that's why we're including the plus or minus on each one of those factors. Why don't you guys list the factors of three? So three is a prime number. So I just have one and that prime number itself. So just one and three are all of our factors. Now that we've listed all of our factors, we wanna strategically go through and really simplify this list. Cause right now that looks very cumbersome and it's hard to say exactly what a factor is. So I need to reduce this down. Again, I'm gonna take one factor at a time in the numerator and divide through by everything in the denominator and list those out. So I'm gonna start with the first factor of plus or minus one in the numerator. So one divided by one, I'm always gonna get that plus or minus one there is my first term and then or is my first possible rational root. Then I'll take one divided by three to get plus or minus one third as my next possibility. So that takes care of our first factor in the numerator. Now I'm gonna move on to my second factor, which is plus or minus two. Two divided by one is gonna give me two. So I end up with plus or minus two as my next factor, or as my, I'm sorry, as my next possible rational root. And then I'll take the two divided by three, which can't be reduced down at all, so I end up with plus or minus two thirds. So that takes care of that plus or minus two. Now I'll move on and do the same thing with the next factor of four. Four divided by one gives me four, so I end up with plus or minus four. Then I'll have four divided by three, so I also get plus or minus three, or plus or minus four thirds. I'm gonna just fit it down below since I don't have enough space on the same line. That takes care of that four. My last factor here is the eight. So I'm gonna have eight divided by one. So we get plus or minus eight. 
and then the 8 divided by 3 gives us plus or minus 8 thirds. And those are all of our possible rational roots. And again, in example 2 here, our degree is 3 which according to the fundamental theorem of algebra then, I have exactly three roots. And so this list of possible rational roots, I have way more than three. I actually have 16 possible rational roots here. Not all 16 of these are gonna work. I would have at most three of these working, assuming I don't maybe have any complex or ir irrational roots as well. So let's try our third example. We have 4x to the fifth minus 8x cubed minus x minus 10, and we want to find our list of possible rational roots. So we're finding those p's over q's. So for our p's, we're trying to find our factors of what? The constant or the leading coefficient? So for the top, we're finding our factors of our constant, which is going to be negative 10 in this example, over our denominator is our factors of our leading coefficient. What's our leading coefficient? Our leading coefficient here is 4. So why don't you guys list all of the factors of 10 and then list all of the factors of 4. So all of the factors of 10 are going to be plus or minus 1. We have 1 and 10, and then we also have 2 and 5. And I'm just listing them in order from smallest to largest. And then for our factors of 4, I could do 1 times 4, and I could also do 2 times 2. So I have plus or minus 1, plus or minus 2, and plus or minus 4 then. And again, we have that plus or minus because, of course, we could have uh, two positives or two negatives or one negative and one positive to get that negative 10 or that positive 4. From here, we want to list out now all of our possible rational roots in simplified form. And if we were to get a root or a possible rational root that would repeat, there's no need to actually list it twice. So why don't you guys pause the video and list out all of our possible rational roots for example three. So in example three here, just to make sure we have enough space, our first one I'm going to do is I'm going to start with the one and divide that through by everything in the denominator. So one divided by one is giving me plus or minus one then. Then I get one divided by two to get one half. And then we get the 1 divided by 4 gives us with 1 fourth. So there's our first set. Now I'm going to do the same thing with the 2. So 2 divided by 1 is giving me a possible rational root of plus or minus 2. For 2 divided by 2, I can reduce that down, which would give me 1. And since I already have 1 listed, there's no need to list it again. And then for 2 divided by 4, if I were to reduce that down, I end up with 1 half, which is also already listed from our prior one, so there's no new ones to add there. Now I'll take the 5. 5 divided by 1 is going to give us plus or minus 5. 5 divided by 2 cannot be reduced down, and we don't already have it, so we get plus or minus 5 halves. And then 5 divided by 4 again can't be reduced down, so we end up with plus or minus 5 over then. And our last one to worry about is the 10. So 10 divided by 1 is 10. So we get plus or minus 10 in our list. 10 divided by 2 can actually be reduced down, which would give us 5. That's already in our list. And then 10 divided by 4 can also be reduced down to be 5 over 2, which is already listed as well. So those are all of our possible rational roots that we have for example 3. So here, let's look at what one of these kind of gigantic examples would start to look like. And we're going to use the rational roots theorem as we're solving out these examples. So in example four here, it says factor completely and find all the roots for this polynomial of 15x cubed minus 32x squared plus 3x plus 2 equals 0. So we're going to end up using synthetic division in here, and our goal is to be able to factor this completely and find all of the roots. Now I'm starting with a cubic here, and if I could just find one factor, that would be enough to rewrite this as a product of a, that linear factor times a quadratic. And then once we're down to a quadratic, we can use all of our concepts from our last unit. So my goal right now is to find one rational root that will work. Well, the first thing I have to do, instead of just randomly start trying numbers to figure out what rational root would work, let's find our list of potential rational roots. 
So I want to find all of these possible rational roots, which is exactly what we did up above in examples 1, 2, and 3. So we need to find that list of those p's over q's and find all of these possible rational roots. And I want you guys to go ahead and pause the video right here. And why don't you guys find your possible rational roots? So come up with what your p's over q's are. So our p's, remember, is our factors of our constant term. And our constant term in this example is going to be 2 over our q's is our factors of our leading coefficient. And in this example, our leading coefficient is 15. So why don't you guys list out all of the factors of 2 over the factors of 15, reduce that list down, and then we'll check that together. So let's write these out. Our factors of 2, luckily I don't have too many, it's just plus or minus 1 and then plus or minus 2. And then for our factors of 15, we do have a few. We've got plus or minus 1 and 15, and then we could also do 3 and 5. So we've got plus or minus 1, plus or minus 3, plus or minus 5, and then plus or minus that 15. Now from here, I have to expand out this list by just dividing through and reducing. 1 over 1 is going to give me just 1, so I get plus or minus 1. We get 1 over a third, so we get plus or minus 1 third. We get 1 over 5, so we get plus or minus a fifth. We get the 1 over 15. And now I'll have to do the 2 divided by all of these, so we'll get plus or minus 2. Get plus or minus 2 thirds. We get that plus or minus 2 fifths. And then we'll see if we can fit this last one here, this plus or minus 2 over 15. So not too many, definitely not a short list. We do have quite a few possible rational roots to test. But if we're going to have a rational root, it's going to come off of this list. And I want to remind you guys again, these are not all going to be rational roots. This is just our possible list. And it would not be possible for all of these to work since we have way more than three. And we know that here our degree of our polynomial is three. So by the fundamental theorem of algebra, we should end up with exactly three roots. So from here, our next step is going to be is to figure out, well, which one of these works. And we're going to use the concept of synthetic division from our last video. So what we want to do is we want to test the possible rational roots until we find one that works. What makes something a root of a polynomial? What were we looking for when we did synthetic division before that made it a root of a polynomial? We're looking for that remainder to be equal to zero. So when we're testing all of these possible rational roots, our goal that we want to find is to get that remainder equal to zero using that synthetic division. So we're going to use synthetic division until we find one that works. So yes, this is a little bit of kind of guessing and checking because we have to kind of check some and see, well, did the synthetic division work? Did it not work? And so it will be our job to figure out which of these end up working. And once we find one that works, we're going to be good. We don't have to keep checking. We just need to find one that works. So we could pick really our favorite one here. We've got a lot to start with. I've got, I see two integer options. I've got that plus or minus one and the plus or minus two, and then I have a lot of fractions. Now, personally for me, I would rather hope that an integer one would work. So I'm gonna just go ahead and start with the first one. Why don't I just start with positive one and see if I can get that to work. Remember in synthetic division, I have the root here in this kind of half box, and then I'm gonna list all of the coefficients from our polynomial. So our polynomial up here is this 15x cubed, minus 32x squared plus 3x plus 2. So I'm going to list all of those coefficients of 15, negative 32, 3, and 2. Then I'm going to draw this horizontal line underneath. Now from here, synthetic division tells me I bring down the first term. So I'm going to bring down the 15, take 15 times 1, and place it in that second column. So I get 15 times 1 is 15. 
then from here we would add down. So negative 32 plus 15 is leaving us with negative 17. Then we repeat the process. So negative 17 times 1 is giving us a negative 17. Then we add down. So 3 plus negative 17 is giving us negative 14. Negative 14 times the 1. We've got one last one to do. Gives us negative 14. 2 plus negative 14 gives us negative 12. Now remember here, this last number over here is our remainder. And in this case, we ended up with negative 12, which is not equal to 0. So what that tells me is that 1 is not a root. So although 1 came off of the list of possible roots, it is not actually a root for that polynomial. And what that means is I have to try another one from here. So I can kind of cross that off my list up above, and now I'm going to go try another one from here. Now we've got a couple options. We could go to the negative 1, or we could jump up and go to the 2. I definitely wouldn't go to a fraction until I've tried all the integer options, just because the arithmetic is going to be a lot easier. I'm going to go ahead and try 2 next, since it's not that big of a number. So I'll set up that synthetic division. So I have that possible root in the box. I'm going to list out all of my coefficients. We're still using the same polynomial. So we'll have that 15, negative 32, that 3, and that positive 2. Why don't you guys do the synthetic division for this uh, possible root of 2, and let's see if we end up getting our remainder of 0 or not. So let's check this. We're going to bring down that 15 first. 15 times 2 gives us 30. If we add down, I end up getting negative 2. Negative 2 times 2 gives me negative 4. 3 plus negative 4 leaves me with negative 1. And then negative 1 times 2 gives me negative 2, which, hey, if I do 2 minus 2, I end up with 0. So that means that 0 is our remainder here. This is the goal that we wanted to get. So what that tells me then is that 2 is a root of this polynomial. And our goal was to find one out of this list was to find at least one of them that worked. And there might be other ones in this list that works. We'll see as we kind of keep going on through the problem where the other ones did happen to be. But we just happened to find out that 2 is our root here. What that also tells me then is that if 2 is a root, then x minus 2 is a factor. Because remember, our goal was to write our polynomial in factored form and find all the roots. So I'm kind of doing two things at once. I'm trying to find my answers to what would make this equal to 0. And since 2 is a root, if I were to sub in 2, I would get 0 out, which is what makes it a root. That also tells me that the corresponding factor, which is x minus 2, is that factor. The reason this is helpful here is our original polynomial of 15 x cubed minus 32, oops, 32, x squared plus 3x plus 2, we can start factoring. So since 2 is a root, then x minus 2 is a factor, so I can list the original uh, cubic as x minus 2 times our quotient. And remember, our quotient is coming from all of these coefficients that we got using synthetic division. So our quotient then, since I started with an x cubed, I dropped down one power. So my quotient will be an x squared. So I'll have a 15x squared then minus 2x minus 1. And remember, each one of these coefficients of 15, negative 2, and negative 1 is coming from our synthetic division up above. Now, the reason that this is really helpful is I'm down to a quadratic. We know how to solve quadratics. In fact, maybe we can even factor this. So our third step here is going to be to solve our quadratic. And let's see if we can actually factor this quotient here, or this quadratic. So I'm looking for two numbers that multiply to be negative 15, since I have that 15 times the negative 1, and add up to be negative 2. Are there any two numbers that multiply to be negative 15 and add to be negative 2? There are. That will be 3 and negative 5, since 3 times negative 5 is negative 15, and 3 
plus negative 5 is equal to negative 2. So what this means is that I can now factor the quotient that was left behind, and what that will allow me to do is get this original cubic in factored form completely. So we're going to go ahead and factor that 15x squared minus 2x minus 1. Why don't you guys pause the video right here and factor that on your own? Remember that since we have that 15 as a leading coefficient, we are going to have to split the middle term and then factor by grouping from there. Okay, so let's check this together. I've got just enough space. So that negative 2x I'm going to rewrite as 3x minus 5x. And then if I group the first two together, they have a 3x in common, and that leaves us with a 5x plus 1. And then the second two have a negative 1 in common that I want to factor out to get that 5x plus 1. And then from here, since they both have that 5x plus 1 in common, I can continue to factor that out to get 5x oops, plus 1 times the 3x minus 1. And that would be our factored form of our quotient. And the reason this is helpful now is I can keep going from our original step up here. I already have that x minus 2. So that x minus 2 is still a factor. And now that we know how to factor the quadratic, I can rewrite in those two factors of 5x plus 1 and that 3x minus 1. And now I actually have factored form. So down below at the bottom of each of these problems, you guys are going to see a line that says factored form. So I'm just going to rewrite my factored form down here as one of my final answers. And then, oops, that should be a 3. There we go. 3x minus 1. And the reason I know that this is in factored form is each one of these is a linear term. I just have an x and then the numbers. I might have some coefficients on the x with the 5x plus 1 and the 3x minus 1, but I have all linear terms here, and I have three linear terms, which matches up with the fact that I started with an x cubed. Now our last step from here that we need to figure out is we need to find our roots, and we can find our roots using the zero product property. So we already knew that 2 was a root, and that happened because ultimately you're setting x minus 2 equal to 0. So we got x equals 2 as a root. I can do the same thing with the other two factors. So I'll set 5x plus 1 equal to 0, and we end up getting x equals negative 1 fifth because we subtract the 1 and then divide by 5. And then for our last factor of 3x minus 1, if I add the 1 and divide by 3, I end up getting x equals 1 third. So down here on my roots line, my final answer for my roots are going to be x equals 2, x equals negative 1 fifth, and x equals positive 1 third. And that would be our final answer for all of these down here. And the last kind of good thing to always do is a just a kind of mental check. Does this actually make sense here? And so what I'm thinking of is go back to the original problem. What was your degree of your original problem here? So our degree was 3 since we had this 15x cubed minus the 32x squared plus 3x plus 2. So that was our original polynomial. If I have a degree 3, then by the fundamental theorem of algebra, I should have three roots, which matches up with exactly what we found. And so our first root here, we got from our list of possible rational roots. We tried synthetic division until we found one that worked, meaning our remainder was equal to zero. And then once we're left with the quadratic, we can then factor the quadratic like we've been doing before many, many times. And I do want to point out that our other two roots that we got here of negative one-fifth and one-third were actually in our list up above of our possible rational roots. They just weren't the numbers that we tried right away, and they probably wouldn't have been my first guess to try right, right away just because they are some of those fractions. But those are still coming from our list of possible rational roots up above. Okay, let's look at another example. 
So we want to factor this guy completely and find all of the possible rational roots. So this is identical to what we did in the prior example. So we want to start with our P's over Q. So we want to find this list of possible rational roots. So why don't you guys pause the video and find all of your possible rational roots. Remember our P's are coming from our factors of our constant term. So that's our factor of seven over our Q's are coming from our factors of our leading coefficient, which is six in this case. So our factors of seven are just gonna be one and seven. And then our factors, oops, for six are going to be one and six, as well as two and three. So we get one, two, three, three, there we go, and six. And now we just kind of need to simplify out this list. So taking one at a time, I start with one in the numerator. So I get one over one. So we get one, one over two is giving us a half. One over three is giving us a third. Then we get one over six. And then we'll use the seven. So I'll take seven over one. We get seven, seven over two we get seven halves, then seven over three, so we get seven thirds, and then seven over six. Of course, if any of these repeated, I wouldn't need to write them more than once, but in this case, none of these possible rational roots repeat. And here I've got quite a big list. Again, not all of these are gonna work since I have only a degree three here. The next thing I wanna see from here is I want to test some of these and see which ones work. And remember, our goal is to get our remainder equal to zero. That's what we are after. So again, I don't really wanna try any of the fractions unless I absolutely have to. I've, so I've got one, negative one, seven, and negative seven. I'd rather have a smaller number work if possible, so why don't we start with one again? So I'm gonna test one. Our coefficients from our original polynomial are gonna be six, negative 11, negative 10 and 7. Why don't you guys pause the video right here and do the synthetic division and let's see if we get a remainder of 0. So our first step, bring down that 6 and then 6 times 1, put it in the next column. If we add down we get negative 5. Oops, 5. Then from there, negative five times one is giving us a negative five. Then if we add down, we end up with negative 15. And then when we multiply negative 15 times one is giving us negative 15, which it's not looking like we're gonna get a remainder of zero because seven minus 15 is equal to negative eight. That is our remainder here, which does not equal zero. So this one did not work. And that tells me that one then is not a root. And sometimes that happens. Remember we are kind of testing these to see which ones work so we have to do that synthetic division process to find out. Now from here I could go to the 7, I could go to negative 1. In the prior example we had 1 and 2 as our option so I went to 2 next because it wasn't that big of a number. 7 is quite a larger number than 1 so I'm going to try negative 1 instead and see if that comes out to be. If, it's, if it does, great. If it doesn't, then we'll have to try the seven. So I'm gonna relist my exact same coefficient since we're using the same polynomial. Why don't you guys pause the video, do the synthet synthetic division, and let's see if we get a remainder of zero. So we'll bring down that six, six times negative one, negative six. Then we add down and we get negative 17. Negative 17 times a negative 1 is going to give us a positive 17. When we add down, we end up with 7. 7 times negative 1 gives us negative 7, which, ooh, if we add those down, we get our remainder of 0. So that's good. That means that negative 1 here is a factor. Or I'm sorry, negative 1 is a root. What would the corresponding factor be? if negative one is a root. So our corresponding factor would be x minus a negative one, which I could rewrite as x plus one. 
So we found our list of possible rational roots using our p's over q's. Then we had to test one until we got a remainder of zero using synthetic division on our original polynomial. Once we get a remainder of zero, then we stop doing synthetic division because we found one that works. So negative one is a root, which means x plus one is a factor. So what that tells us then is the original polynomial that we had of 6x cubed minus 11x squared minus this 10x plus seven, I can write in factored form with x plus one, since that was one of our factors, times our quotient. And remember our quotient is coming from our synthetic division. And since we started with an x cubed and we divided through by a linear term, we dropped down one power, so our quotient will be a quadratic. Why don't you guys pause the video and write out the quotient. So the quotient will be six times x squared, squared, there we go, minus 17x plus seven. And remember all those coefficients are coming from the six, negative 17, and the seven that we got through synthetic division. And it's an x squared since we started with an x cubed and we dropped down one power. We can also think about this if we were to foil this out, if I take this x and the x plus one and multiply it to the six x squared, that's how I'd end up with the six x cubed. Now from here, our goal is to continue to solve the quadratic. So. We need to figure out, can I factor it? If I can, great. If I can't factor it, then I'd have to think about what else I could do. But we need to now deal with that quadratic that's left over. So why don't we pause the video and decide if we can factor this quadratic. So we're looking for two numbers that multiply to be six times seven, so multiply to be 42, and add up to be negative 17. What do you guys think? Do are there any two numbers that work? So there are actually two numbers that work. It will be negative three and then negative 14. And so we're gonna go ahead and factor this quadratic. So we started with six x squared minus 17 x plus seven. Again, since we have that leading coefficient, I can't go straight to x minus three and x minus 14. I have to split the middle term and factor by grouping. So why don't you guys pause the video and finish factoring. So when we factor this, I'll get a negative 3x minus that 14x plus seven, group the first two together. So the first two terms have a 3x in common, which would leave us with a 2x minus one. And then the last two terms have a negative seven in common. And I wanna make sure I take out the negative sign so that I end up with that two X minus one as well on the inside. And then from there, since they both have a two X minus one, that can factor out. And then we have that three X minus seven that's left over. And the reason that this is helpful now is if I go back up to our x plus one times our quadratic, I can continue to factor this. So I'll have that x plus one still times, oops, parentheses, there we go, times this two x, and let's, there we go, two x minus one times that three x minus seven. So now we have it all the way in factored form, and I could actually add that down here. Probably just should have written it down below on our final answer line. So we have the factored form since we have all of the linear terms now. The last thing we have to do is find all of our roots. So why don't you guys pause the video right now and use the zero product property to find all of your roots for the other two factors. So we already know that since x plus one is a factor, if I set that equal to zero, we can get that x equals negative one. And then for the two x plus one, if we set that guy equal to zero, 
we'll end up getting x equals negative 1 half by subtracting 1 and then dividing by 2. And then for our last factor of 3x minus 7 equals 0, we're going to end up getting x equals 7 over 3 by adding the 7 and then dividing through by that 3. So I can list my roots down here then as negative 1, negative 1 half, and 7 thirds. And just kind of as a final check, we want to make sure does this actually make sense. So what was the degree of our original polynomial? The degree of our original polynomial was 3. I have 3 roots, which according to the fundamental theorem of algebra is exactly what I should end up with on here. Now, we could make these examples more complicated if we were to start with a higher degree. So on each one of these, because we started with an x cubed, once we found a root that worked, we were able to factor it into a linear and a quadratic, and then we could use stuff from unit two. Now, of course, if we start with something with a higher degree, we're going to actually have a lot more involved in each one of these. And I, the other thing I meant to point out was that the other two roots we got here in example four from, or in example five, of negative one half and seven thirds were in our list up above, so it does make sense to actually get those as answers.